Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome. These public health conversations are meant as spaces where we come together for conversations that shape a healthier world. How we create a healthier world starts with how we talk about health. To that end, through our public health conversations, we welcome speakers who can guide our thinking towards deeper understanding of the issues that shape health. Thank you for joining us, for being part of that conversation. Thank you too to the many who worked to make today happen, particularly Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel, and to Dr. Jamie Gradus, who was the intellectual architect of today's event. Today's event is one of a series of five events that we're hosting through 2022. Our school strategy map articulates five strategic directions that serve as a cross-cutting focus for much of our work that we aspire to inform through our scholarship, infuse in our educational programs, and engage with in our practice. The first of these events is today, where we shall turn our lens to mental and behavioral health. Specifically today, we shall focus on the social causes and the mental health consequences of trauma. With our speakers, we will explore how racial, social, and economic inequities add to the burden of trauma and how we can work to mitigate this burden. This event is going to be split into two sessions guided by our moderators, Dr. Paula Schnorr and Dr. Jamie Gradus. First, introduction of Dr. Schnorr. Dr. Schnorr is Executive Director of the VA National Center for PTSD, as well as Professor of Psychiatry at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. Dr. Schnorr is Editor-in-Chief of the Clinician's Trauma Update Online. She's also a Fellow of the American Psychological Association, the Association for Psychological Science, past President of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, and former Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Traumatic Stress. The session that follows will then be facilitated by Dr. Gradus. Dr. Gradus is an Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the Boston University School of Public Health, as well as Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Gradus has published extensively on epidemiology of trauma and trauma-related disorders with a particular focus on suicide outcomes. Dr. Gradus has been the person who has really conceived of and thought of the, um, the, the program for, these, for today. It's now my great pleasure to turn this event over to Dr. Schnorr, who is going to introduce the speakers for and moderate our first session. Dr. Schnorr. Thank, thank you, Dr. Galea. It's an honor to be here with you and Dr. Gradus and this uh, wonderful panel that you've pulled together. Let me uh, introduce who you'll be hearing from this morning. First, uh, you'll hear from Dr. Catherine Magruder. Dr. Magruder is Professor of Psychiatry and Public Health Sciences at the Medical University of South Carolina. She's overseen many studies relating to PTSD in US war veterans. And she recently completed a Fulbright Award at Hasetup University in Ankara, Turkey, where she studied trauma and PTSD in Turkish civilians. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Juliet McClendon, Dr. McClendon is the Director of Medical Affairs at Big Health. She's a clinical psychologist whose work emphasizes evidence-based practice, culturally responsive care, and mental health equity. Dr. McClendon studies the impact of stress on racial and ethnic disparities in health. Then we'll hear from Dr. Rachel Seiko Adams. Dr. Adams is a scientist at the Institute for Behavioral Health at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. And she's also a proud alum of the Boston University School of Public Health. She's a health services researcher with expertise examining co-occurring substance use and mental health conditions following traumatic brain injury. And last, we will turn to Dr. Jennifer Sumner. Dr. Sumner is a clinical psychologist and an assistant professor of psychology at the University of California in Los Angeles, where she's also the director of the Sumner Stress Lab. Her program of research lies at the intersection of the psychological and physical health consequences of traumatic exposure. So I welcome all of you and we look forward, to, I, I'm now turning things over to Dr. Magruder. So thank you so much, Paula. Um, and thank you, Dean Galea, for sponsoring um, this program, this important program. Um, because this is the Boston University School of Public Health where we're speaking, I wanted to bring to the mix some big picture public health themes. Most of the panelists will be talking about consequences of trauma and PTSD, but prevention definitely needs to be on the table. Um, prevention is one of the most important, if not the most important tenet of public health. So this slide is to point out that prevention can occur at multiple levels, ranging from the individual um, all the way up through um, the society. So hold this model um, in one hand, and then let's look at um, different 
um, levels of prevention, um, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Um, and in terms of trauma and PTSD, of course, we're looking at primary prevention, which would be the prevention of trauma itself, secondary, um, which would be prevention of the development of the disorder of PTSD, and tertiary, the prevention of um, poorer outcomes from PTSD, including disability, death, or additional diseases or disorders. So imagine now that we could develop primary, secondary, and tertiary preventive strategies that could be implemented at the different systems levels, that is societal, community, family, and individual. Um, so take, for example, education for students to avoid high-risk date rape situations, primary prevention, preventing the, uh, uh, the trauma at the individual level, or programs to prevent domestic violence, primary prevention at the relationship level, neighborhood watch programs, better lighting in parking lots to prevent assaults, primary prevention at the community level, um, or even gun control policies, drunk driving laws, primary prevention at the societal level. Um, and I won't go on to secondary and tertiary prevention, um, which are really early intervention and effective treatment um, kinds of programs, um, but hopefully we can have time for some examples of those um, if there is additional time. So this approach to prevention, especially primary prevention, opens the door to join forces and be supportive of other endeavors. Um, so even though we may have trauma and PTSD as our main focus, um, there are other people with whom we should be um, engaged. For example, Mothers Against Drunk Driving and other highway safety programs, gun control groups, neighborhood coalitions for um, safer streets, programs that promote equality of women to reduce sexual assaults, programs that promote equality of uh, racial ethnic groups to prevent hate crimes, um, programs that prevent uh, that uh, promote um, equality of LGBTQ persons, um, and even peacekeeping efforts, you know, to prevent and reduce the traumas of war. Um, There's a lot of overlapping space with these programs, and I think it's worth it to consider prevention coalitions with them. Last, um, and certainly not least, um, there are a number of tensions inherent in a public health approach. Um, individual freedoms versus societal good. Is my right to carry a gun versus the right of society to, be, um, to reduce gun violence? poverty versus wealth. Trauma does not occur randomly. Um, overwhelmingly, there are more traumatic events in low income areas and in poorer areas. And then politics versus science. You know, what, what, we, what the data show us may not be what uh, politicians, what uh, informs politics, although we would like it to be. Um, so I think with that, I'll, that's kind of sets the stage um, for the additional presentations and um, um, we can move from there. Hi everyone. Um, I hope everyone can see that. All right. Um, it's uh, nice to be here. Um, I'm Dr. Juliet McClendon and um, I'm happy to, to be here today to talk more about the impact of racism and racial oppression on um, mental health and racial trauma. Um, so I'm currently director of medical affairs at Big Health, which is a mental health digital therapeutics company. Um, all opinions and everything I'll state in here are my own opinions. Um, and then my previous affiliations um, were with Boston University, VA Boston, and Washington University in St. Louis. Um, so my work um, over the years has really focused on um, the impact of things like racism and discrimination on the health of people of color um, and other marginalized groups. Um, so I focused on racial stress and trauma as well as mental health and mental health care equity, um, access to evidence-based treatments and culturally responsive treatment. 
And so whenever I do a talk like this, I really like to focus on um, really understanding what our definitions are and what we're talking about. So we're on the same page. And so one thing I'll start with is health equity. Um, and health equity is um, really defined as the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. Um, but really the only way we're able to do this is to focus here on equity um, and, rather than things like equality. So equality is really this one size fits all approach where people are given the same resources in order to, for example, have optimal health. But what we know is that people are starting at different points, as you can see here on the left under equality. And so giving everyone the same resources does not bring everyone up to the same level of optimal mental health. On the other hand, when we think about equity, if we give everyone the supports they need based on their unique circumstances, um, then we're able to help them reach a level of equity because we're focusing on attending to their specific needs. I also like to define um, things like race and culture and ethnicity. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but what I wanna get across here is that um, and actually two of these circles of ethnicity and culture should be overlapping as well, but that race, culture, and ethnicity are different but overlapping constructs um, that describe someone's identity. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about people of color and people of color I define as those groups that have been historically and ongoing and in an ongoing basis marginalized um, specifically here in, in US society. Um, so Black individuals, African-American, Asian-American, um, Native American, et cetera. And so next, I like to have a definition of racism. I think um, oftentimes when I talk to people about this, people really do have different definitions of what racism is. For the purposes of my work and this talk, um, I describe racism as the combination of prejudice and power. And what that means is that there's an ideology of the superiority of white people and the inferiority of non-white people. And because of that ideology, what ends up happening is that resources get distributed unevenly and they tend to go to those who are seen as more privileged in um, the society and um, not to those who are less privileged in that society. And so what ends up happening specifically in the case of racial and ethnic uh, minorities or people of color is that there are fewer resources devoted to those, um, those populations. And that leads to an imbalance of power. Um, and the purpose of that is really to reinforce and maintain white supremacy. Now, I'm just gonna briefly go over some different forms of racism um, so that we can understand all the different ways in which people of color experience racism um, so that we can sort of understand really the full extent of, um, of what is affecting their mental health. So things like institutional or systemic racism, which I know we, we have heard a lot about and talked a lot about, um, these are policies and formal or informal practices um, that serve to um, uh, treat two groups of people differently, for example. Um, so again, these policies don't necessarily have to be like written in, uh, you know, the, the written in laws or written in code, but sometimes there are just ways we've always done things that actually exacerbate inequities. Here are some examples. So for example, one that's very pertinent to what we're talking about today is the lack of representation of clinicians of color in a hospital, um, lack of representation in leadership. Um, and uh, those are the most sort of relevant to thinking about healthcare systems and healthcare. Another form of racism that people of color experience um, regularly are microaggressions. Um, so these are subtle slights and insults that communicate demeaning messages to individuals with marginalized identities. So here are some examples in terms of, for example, asking somebody, you know, maybe who has an accent or who looks like, you know, who's non-white, you know, where are you from? And then sort of, no, where are you really from? And, you know, that communicates you don't belong here. Um, talking about wanting to diversify the workforce, but not wanting to lower standards. Um, you know, again, you're good at math, right? You know, all people like you excel at math. It's this model minority myth that many, particularly Asian Americans face. Um, I don't even think of you as black, you know, so this, this, it, it, it's something like that is almost meant to be a compliment, but what it really communicates is that, you know, all black people behave in a certain negative way and you're not like that. 
um, and you're so well spoken. Sort of this idea that um, it's surprising if a person of color or a black person, you know, is a, is able to speak coherently and so well, um, and people know that, and and that can give across the message that you know people like you don't really speak proper English, but you do. Other forms of racism people experience are things like unconscious bias, aversive racism, which is an aspect of sort of being um, uh, isolated or separated from a group, sort of being ignored or unacknowledged. Um, stereotype threat is the idea that um, when somebody, when a stereotype about a person's particular um, racial or ethnic group is activated, um, it affects their performance because they're trying to sort of um, prove against the stereotype. And internalized racism, um, which is really sort of an internalization by a person of color of all of the racist messages they hear in society um, to the point where they may start believing some of those um, negative and racist messages. And so what I see as one of the problems with our research right now is that we've really focused a lot in clinical science and clinical psychology on the interpersonal and individual aspects of life that contribute to mental health problems. But what we really need to focus on is all of these levels of analysis um, from public policy to community to organizational factors um, in order to really understand and impact mental health inequities. And so I'll go briefly through a few um, studies I've done. This was a study um, that I did at the VA um, uh, with um, Leslie Hausman, one of her studies. And what we found, I'll just summarize here, is that um, what we found is that the impact of discrimination was cumulative across different um, uh, identities. So um, for people who had multiple disadvantaged identities, so for example, being low income, being um, a woman, being um, African-American and being disabled, um, the more, ide more disadvantaged identities people had, then they experienced more discrimination or reported that, and that led to higher symptoms of depression and pain. So this is just to show that just the impact of discrimination is cumulative. In addition, in this particular study, um, what we found was that um, the impact of discrimination is intersectional. So in here, if you look at the line with the star next to it, um, what we find, what, we, what I, we found in this particular study was that for black women, the impact of discrimination or the discriminatory stress had a larger and more significant impact on um, uh, uh, um, increases in PTSD symptoms compared with black men. So we see here that, that that intersection of gender identity and racial identity is important to consider and understand how that contributes to the impact of discrimination or racism on mental health. And so we see here, and we've seen in previous research that um, discriminate, discrimination and discriminatory stress does indeed have a significant impact on, um, on trauma and PTSD symptoms. And I'm just going to skip this here real quick. And so some takeaways, discrimination is absolutely a determinant of health disparities. Um, it is cumulative over both over the lifetime as well as across different aspects of identity. And the intersection of race and gender also shapes the impact of discrimination on PTSD. And so what this leads to is uh, much research over the years showing that racism and discrimination is associated with a variety of health outcomes and in particular health disparities in things like birth outcomes, health conditions, psychiatric symptoms, um, risk for psychiatric disorders, substance and alcohol misuse, as well as um, healthcare disparities in terms of delays in seeking care and mistrust in healthcare, um, as well as overall lower quality of life, and even suicidal ideation. So we see that racism and discrimination has wide ranging impacts on the mental health of people of color. And how I think about this is that people have um, sort of these predetermined um, factors that contribute to their stress threshold. It sort of determines what is sort of like, where is that level where that stress goes to a point where a person can no longer cope. And so as people experience cumulative racial, racial stress over the course of their lifetime, including things like, you know, internalized racism, racial harassment, racial battle fatigue. So the idea of really working and working to make a difference and really like that wearing on a person. 
um, images of racial violence, microaggressions, and that as people experience this over time, that cumulative impact of those racial stressors can lead some can lead someone to um, sort of experience stress that crosses crosses their ability to um, cope, and that leads to racial trauma. And this is just to show sort of how we define racial trauma as I just showed in that image. And these are many of the researchers that have been working tirelessly on defining and discussing racial trauma and bringing it to the fore of our conversations. Um, and so racial trauma is a stressor that's unique to people of color. I'm sorry, race, racism in general. Um, and what racism does is that it can cause emotional and psychological injuries. Um, of course, as well as physical injuries in circum certain circumstances, but even those emotional and psychological injuries that might not necessarily um, sort of fit into a di diagnosis of PTSD may still have significant impacts on the mental health of people of color. Um, and that's sort of what we call racial trauma. Um, again, it, that those experiences of racism and stress accumulate beyond a person's ability to cope. And um, just a couple more slides. So these are some of the common symptoms of racial trauma. They, over, um, they overlap with PTSD symptoms, depressive symptoms. Um, and so we see that people can experience a range of these, um, irritability, um, intrusive thoughts about racist incidents, um, low mood, numbness, um, exhaustion, um, increased vigilance, shame and guilt, hopelessness, um, so we see a lot of um, these symptoms among individuals who've experienced racial trauma. And last, I just wanna um, sort of uh, define or um, talk about racial trauma versus PTSD. So experiences of racism can certainly cause PTSD, sort of that it can be a criterion A event that involves, you know, actual or threatened, you know, physical bodily harm or sexual violence. And so experiences of racism can lead to PTSD as we, as defined in the DSM. Um, but also cumulative exposure to racism can lead to traumatic stress symptoms. There's a lot of uh, literature showing this, and that's what we call racial trauma. Um, when maybe the experiences that a person has had don't meet that criteria, that criterion A, but that person has still experienced significant stress over their lifetime that, that it leads to traumatic stress symptoms. And one thing that really differentiates PTSD from racial trauma is that racism is really an ongoing stressor or trauma. And so, you know, when we talk about PTSD, we're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is um, an event that, or a post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, shows itself post a trauma, after a trauma has happened and ended. Um, but racism is something that is continuously going on and that people are continuously experiencing. And so that's something that really needs to be considered and addressed when we're thinking about how to um, sort of treat or intervene with people who are experiencing racial trauma. And that suggests that it's possible that current um, PTSD evidence-based treatments may not be the most effective for addressing racial trauma. Um, and so we need to figure out what are the best approaches. And finally, you know, there's also this question of should racial trauma be included in the DSM as a subset of PTSD or as its own diagnosis? And there are a lot of questions around whether we should pathologize or not pathologize racial trauma. Um, this is something that we could talk about for hours, so I won't get too deep into that. Um, but there are really significant considerations on both sides of the issue around whether or not that's something that should be considered a mental disorder and put into the DSM. And I will stop there. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation and um, thank you so much for having me speak today. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Seiko Adams. I am really pleased to return to my alma mater today to give this presentation and be involved in this excellent panel. Thanks to Dean Galea and Dr. Gratis for the invitation. I would like to first acknowledge my colleagues at Brandeis University, as well as Drs. Um, John Corrigan and Kristen Damms O'Connor. Um, much of this work was done with their collaboration and also acknowledge our funding from Nidler. We have a grant at Brandeis where we've been examining how the um, opioid epidemic has been impacting individuals with disabilities, of which 
people with traumatic brain injury are a key um, subgroup that we've been focusing on. So traumatic brain, or traumatic brain injury or TBI occurs when an external force causes an alteration in consciousness, and it can range in severity from mild to severe. A concussion is considered a mild injury, and the effects can be temporary or permanent. However, we've learned in more recent years that many individuals who experience a more mild injury or a concussion do go on to experience ongoing symptoms for many years. And because TBI can occur during a traumatic event, persons with TBI often have comorbid mental health conditions such as PTSD. And in the United States, estimates range from about 23% to 43% of adults have, have experienced at least one TBI in their lifetime. So while there's been decades of research looking at at-risk alcohol use following TBI, research on opioid use and risks of opioid use following TBI is really more recent and it's only been done in the past several years. Um, the Journal of Head Trauma Rehabilitation had a topical issue on TBI and opioids last fall of which I was the guest editor and I wrote the preface. And so today I'll be walking through um, the theory of the perfect storm of risk for opioid use and consequences following TBI and some of the findings from that special issue and ending with future research priorities. So here's a visual model of the perfect storm theory that I developed with Drs. Corrigan and Dams O'Connor, which posits that persons with TBI may have in phase one greater exposure to opioids due to secondary conditions that are common after TBI, um, especially pain. And then given exposure to opioids, phase two suggests that persons with TBI may face greater likelihood of progressing to long-term opioid therapy, opioid misuse, or opioid use disorder. And then phase three suggests that if someone with a TBI does go on to develop opioid use disorder, that they may face greater barriers engaging successfully in opioid use disorder treatment. And both phases two and three have been shown to increase risk for adverse consequences, including overdose and suicide. So I'm gonna begin with phase one of the perfect storm now. So acute and chronic pain are very common following TBI. There's numerous studies showing this, and this is true in both civilian and military veteran populations. Here is a visual from findings from um, a middle-aged community dwelling population in the United States of adults in their 40s. And what you'll see here on the left is that among men in their 40s, um, men who have a history of TBI have more than twice the rate of reporting chronic pain than those without TBI, 60% versus 28%. And this is true among females as well. So 46% among females in their 40s who have a history of TBI have chronic pain compared to over a little bit above a quarter of females without TBI. Um, and so in the United States, we know that acute and chronic pain have been drivers of prescription opioid receipt. So this increased likelihood of pain following TBI likely increases risk for exposure to opioids. So for military members who've experienced a TBI during um, a deployment, we know that TBI rarely occurs in isolation. So in the military, they've created this term polytrauma clinical triad, which relates to the commonly overlapping conditions of chronic pain, PTSD, and TBI. And so this is a study we did at Brandeis of active duty soldiers returning from deployment to Afghanistan or, you know, or Iraq of a large sample. And we found that in fact, um, TBI, chronic pain, and PTSD were more commonly found overlapping than in isolation. So in fact, over a quarter of the sample had the polytrauma clinical triad. And importantly, what we found was that as comorbidities increased, so did likelihood of opioid receipt in the VA over the next year. So um, individuals with all three conditions were more, most likely to receive prescription opioids and also most likely to receive a greater day supply of them, so over 30 days. 
So now I'll move on to phase two of the perfect storm. So given exposure to opioids, we posit that those with a history of TBI will go on to have increased likelihood of developing opioid misuse or OUD, as well as progressing to long-term opioid therapy. So this is a study we did um, that was in the topical issue. Um, and it was with data from the 2018 Ohio Burfus, the Behavioral Risk, Risk Factor Surveillance System Survey, in which we were examining um, how lifetime history of TBI was associated with past year prescription opioid use and past year prescription opioid misuse. And what we found is that individuals with the TBI were 1.5 times the odds of reporting past year prescription opioid use and 1.65 times the odds of past year prescription opioid misuse relative to adults without a history of TBI. And um, in the topical issue, there was another paper by Tam et al, which looked at adolescents who reported a sports related concussion. And they were also more likely to report prescription opioid misuse versus adolescents without a sports related concussion. So, um, Cognitive deficits um, that are common following TBI, such as memory problems or executive functioning limitations, may lead to med medication mismanagement or poor adherence to prescribed dosing. And also mood disorders common after TBI, such as depression or anxiety, or sleep disturbance or traumatic stress, including PTSD, are all independent risk factors for increased at-risk substance use. And prefrontal cortex damage to the brain following TBI may also increase impulsive behavior, making it more difficult to self-regulate substance use. So we posit that for some individuals, these neurobehavioral changes may converge post-TBI to increased risk for opioid misuse or OUD. So now I'll move on to the third phase of the perfect storm that if someone with a history of TBI does develop opioid use disorder, that they may face greater barriers to accessing or successfully engaging in opioid use disorder treatment. Um, and unfortunately, we, we've really found no studies that directly investigate this. So there are no studies looking at opioid use disorder treatment among persons with TBI. There are a few studies that have looked at substance use disorder treatment more generally. And in general, those have found that um, persons with TBI have faced greater um, barriers and do not succeed as well in those programs without um, appropriate accommodations. So what we've seen so far is that persons with TBI are more likely to have greater exposure to opioids. They've been shown to, if, if, use, if receiving opioids, be more likely to advance to opioid misuse. And we suspect that they mo may, may face more greater um, challenges accessing OUD treatment or succeeding in those programs. And so the consequences for this go beyond development of addiction or development of OUD, which I'll talk about briefly next. Um, so evidence has been mounting over the past several years in both civilian and military veteran studies that TBI is associated with increased risk for both non-fatal overdose as well as overdose deaths. So uh, a study by Fonda and Gratis et al. Um, using the VA in, VA in the VA found that um, post 9-11 veterans with a traumatic brain injury diagnosis um, who were receiving long-term opioid therapy for, for chronic pain were at three times as likely to experience an opioid overdose compared to um, those without a TBI diagnosis. Um, using civilian data, there um, was a study of um, individuals who had a moderate or severe TBI and went on to have inpatient rehabilitation. And those individuals were found to be 11 times more likely to die from an accidental drug poisoning two thirds of which involved an opioid um, compared to adults their same age. And then lastly, another VA study found that um, veterans with a diagnosis of TBI were at increased risk for death by drug overdose. This was not specific to opioids. Um, and this was true for all TBI severities. And importantly, all of these studies, these findings remained after accounting for psychiatric comorbidities, including PTSD. So um, for years now, studies have found an association between traumatic brain injury and increased risk for death by suicide. 
Um, and we've also seen that um, both long-term opioid therapy and opioid use disorder increase risk for death, death by suicide. There has been one study in the VA which looked at veterans prescribed long-term opioid therapy to treat chronic pain. And they found that um, veterans with TBI were at, at increased risk for suicide attempt compared to those without TBI. So we posit that additional research is needed to see if um, opioid use following TBI increases risk for death by suicide among this population. So I'll conclude with some research priorities. Um, to date, no study has investigated illicit opioid use following TBI or how prescription opioid use may be a pathway to illicit opioid use. And this is particularly important since around 2012 in our country, um, the opioid epidemic shift, shifted into its second and third waves, which are more characterized by use of illicit opioids such as heroin or fentanyl. There's also been very little exploring differences in opioid use and consequences following TBI by sex or gender or race ethnicity. Um, additional research is needed to determine if persons with TBI face additional barriers accessing engaging in evidence-based opioid use disorder treatment, including the use of medication therapy. And we feel that this is really of utmost importance considering additional findings showing that persons with TBI are at increased risk for opioid misuse, which is a risk factor for OUD. And then lastly, we suggest additional piloting and evaluating of alternative pain management strategies for individuals with TBI and chronic pain, and that this is urgently needed, um, including use of non-pharmacological treatments um, to meet the needs of this high-risk population. So thank you so much again for being here. I look forward to the discussion that we're gonna have shortly. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. It's really such a pleasure to be here today as part of this panel, really looking forward to the discussion on this really important topic. And so today I'm gonna to be talking about understanding how trauma affects physical health. So as we've heard today, you know, trauma is common. And we really see that the vast majority of individuals will experience at least one traumatic event during their lifetime. And although many individuals are resilient after trauma, we do see that trauma can affect mental health in a number of different ways, whether that's developing post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, symptoms of depression or anxiety, as well as misuse of alcohol and drugs. But what we see is that the impact of trauma doesn't just end with the mind. And indeed, trauma can also have important implications for physical health. And this was work done from the World Mental Health Surveys. This was a study conducted across 14 different countries around the world. And they found that greater exposure to traumatic events was linked to onset of a number of physical health conditions, including arthritis, back pain, asthma, chronic lung disease, diabetes, ulcer, headaches, hypertension, and heart attack. And the research that I do aims to understand just how that works. How does trauma in turn affect our physical health? And so I'd like to share with you some work that I've done in this area, specifically by focusing on heart health in women after trauma. And when it comes to heart health, cardiovascular disease encompasses a group of disorders of the heart and blood vessels. And cardiovascular disease or CVD is the leading cause of death and disability, both in the United States as well as worldwide. On average, someone dies of CVD every 36 seconds. And CVD claims more lives than cancer and chronic lower respiratory disease combined. Additionally, CVD is costly. So in the US, direct medical costs of cardiovascular disease, as well as the indirect costs due to lost productivity, were estimated at a staggering $378 billion. And this was just for the 2017 to 2018 year. Importantly though, approximately 80% of CVD events are preventable. 
And our discussion of the burden of CBD is really especially timely as February is American Heart Month. And so this really is a great time to appreciate the factors that can promote as well as detract from our cardiovascular health. And you know, why adopt a women's health focus as well when thinking about links between trauma and cardiovascular disease in particular? Well, what we see is that the vast majority of research on trauma, PTSD, and cardiovascular outcomes has been conducted in predominantly male samples of veterans. And military personnel certainly experience trauma at high rates, but this is by no means the only context in which trauma and PTSD operate. And so there are several reasons why it's really important to specifically study the links between trauma, PTSD, and cardiovascular outcomes, specifically in women. So for one, we see that PTSD is twice as common in women than in men. It's estimated that approximately one in 10 women will develop PTSD in their lifetime as opposed to one in 20 men. Additionally, we see that PTSD is more chronic, severe, and impairing in women than in men as well. And furthermore, not only is PTSD more common and impairing in women than in men, but we also see that there are sex differences in cardiovascular disease. So for example, symptoms of CBD can differ for women and men. So women, for example, when they're having a heart attack, they may present with symptoms of nausea or dizziness as opposed to symptoms like left arm pain, which is something that maybe men may be more likely to present with when having a heart attack. Additionally, we see that there are certain CBD risk factors that are either unique to or more potent in women than in men. So for instance, hypertension during pregnancy is a CVD risk factor that's unique to women. And then factors like smoking and diabetes, these are actually found to be more strongly related to risk of CVD in women than in men. And additionally, despite a number of efforts to really address these sex differences in CVD and its consequences, we actually see that the rates of high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease have been rising in women, particularly younger women. And when I'm talking about younger women, this is women as young as 35 to 55 years of age. And so my colleagues and I have been able to address these unanswered questions in women with respect to trauma, PTSD, and CVD risk. So in a sample of just over 54,000 female US nurses in the US who have been studied for over 20 years, we were able to document trauma exposure and PTSD symptoms that onset over the course of these women's lifetimes. And here in these women, we were looking at a range of traumatic experiences from being exposed to a natural disaster, to assault, to the sudden unexpected death of a loved one, to a miscarriage or stillbirth. And we were able to use this information to look at how trauma and PTSD related to a wide range of cardiovascular outcomes. So ranging from traditional CVD risk factors like hypertension or high blood pressure, to acute CVD events like having a heart attack or a stroke, to even more rare cardiovascular events like venous thromboembolism, which involves developing blood clots in your veins. And we found that compared to women with no trauma exposure, women with elevated PTSD symptoms were more likely to develop hypertension, heart attack, stroke, and venous thromboembolism. So a psychological response to trauma, PTSD, was linked to developing CVD, a physical health condition. Additionally, even women with trauma alone were more likely to experience these cardiovascular events. In addition, we found that unhealthy behaviors and health conditions explained part of the link between PTSD and CVD events. So factors like smoking, poor diet quality, physical inactivity, and weight, these in turn accounted in part for the link between PTSD and cardiovascular disease, suggesting that these play a role on that pathway between PTSD and how it in turn can contribute to the onset of cardiovascular disease. 
So that's where we've been. Where are we headed? So I'd like to highlight some next steps with respect to research, practice, and policy. So really one of the next research questions that we have in front of us is to determine if treating PTSD can yield benefits for cardiovascular health. So if we improve PTSD, can we offset that CVD risk? And again, keeping in mind that the vast majority of CVD events are preventable. So it's of interest to really be looking at how can we change trajectories of cardiovascular risk to promoting cardiovascular health. With respect to practice, our work also highlights the importance of assessing health behaviors like smoking, physical activity, and diet, specifically in the context of mental health treatment after trauma, as these may be important for helping to promote cardiovascular health. And then finally, with respect to policy, this really demonstrates the need to advocate for integrated mental and physical health care. We can't just be treating things above the neck as separate from things below the neck. So thank you so much for, again, your attention today and the opportunity to be a, a part of this fantastic event and looking forward to the discussion. Well, I'd like to thank uh, all of the panelists for uh, such thoughtful and uh, provocative uh, ideas. Uh, I invite everyone to come on uh, camera now uh, uh, on the panel. And I would like to start with a few questions of my own before we open to uh, the attendees. And I see people are putting some excellent questions in the Q&A. So um, we, uh, we are bound to have a very lively discussion. I, I think the question I wanna ask relates most strongly to the, the last presentation by Dr. Sumner, but anybody I think could answer it. And it has to do with trauma, PTSD, and physical health uh, effects. Since the diagnosis of PTSD was formalized in 1980, there's been a literature growing on this. And yet it's, it's still not widely recognized in many aspects of healthcare. And if, it, you know, if you think about it, in fact, exposure to a traumatic event can be conceptualized as a hidden variable in understanding the relationships between um, targets of, of, or understanding the uh, targets of public health campaigns, such as smoking, substance use, poor diet, lack of exercise, and, and so on. So I, I'd like to ask all of the panelists, uh, do you see this lack of recognition about the physical health impacts of trauma in your area? And if so, what can be done about it? I think that's a, such a great question, Paula, and I'm happy to, to kick off the discussion related to it. You know, I think it's really highlighting such, you know, an important area where we really do need to shine the light of awareness. And, you know, I think appreciating that trauma and PTSD can have profound effects, you know, not only for mental health, but also for physical health. And how can we increase this awareness, both in sort of the, maybe the mental health side, the physical health treatment side, but then also from a public health perspective. And I think, you know, trying to kind of increase awareness that, you know, these types of experiences don't just end at the impact of emotional health. And so how can we be thinking about, you know, increasing screening for trauma and PTSD in medical settings as a way to potentially, you know, be identifying those individuals who may be at risk for, you know, a number of physical health conditions and kind of using that to, again, be beginning to identify those at increased risk and potentially connecting to care that can be ideally, you know, uh, multifaceted in that way. Um, I think that there is the, the, I think the way that in sort of the racial disparities, racial inequities literature, you know, there's a conceptualization of stress in general as being something that contributes to poor health outcomes. And there's a lot about, you know, um, racial disparities and physical, there's a lot more written about racial disparities in physical health than in mental health with an understanding that they, any kind of stress or chronic stress contributes to physical health um, problems. So I think that there may be, um, a bit more of a recognition within that literature that, you know, things like intense stressors, including trauma, are associated with physical health outcomes because there is such a focus on physical health disparities. Um, and so I, I think that that is there, but I think that 
um, as Jennifer was saying, or Dr. Sumner is what's really missing is, a, you know, um, consistent um, uh, a measurement and assessment of those experiences in order to be able to shape how, you know, doctors and physicians approach the care for their patients. Well, I, I would add that this argues for early intervention, early treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder in, so that you can prevent the long-term sequelae um, and those long-term illnesses from developing. And I would add to that, dementia is not another illness that has been shown to be related to PTSD. So. Rachel, I didn't know if you wanted to add a comment before. Sure. Yeah, I'll just echo the importance of this this hidden hidden concept and, and additional screening and, and so specific to TBI. Um, you know, just many um, the large majority are mild injuries or concussions, and and there would be no you know people wouldn't know from talking to someone necessarily that they have this history. So the importance of um, clinicians screening and understanding lifetime history. Um, as I mentioned, it's it's higher than people might think, you know, up to 40% of the population has experienced at least one TBI in their lifetime. Um, and that increases risk for psychiatric conditions, um, as well as substance use problems and other physical health conditions as well. Um, so more, more awareness um, is important for prevention. Thank you. Uh, now I want to ask a question that is very broad uh, for uh, all of the panelists. And uh, in your area or any area, what do you think are the highest priorities for action? Kathy, I thought you might say prevention, prevention, prevention. Yeah, no, you, you've got that. I, I, I do believe prevention would be the highest priority. Um, but it's not the only thing, you know, you can do, you can do things with the right hand and also with the left hand. So you can work on prevention activities as well as improving treatment, early intervention, screening, I think, and policies to, um, for better recognition of PTSD and better payment for um, treatments. So I, I think, I think you wouldn't necessarily have to prioritize one thing over another. Um, I would say two things. One, um, prevention, of course, but prevention of trauma, of people experiencing trauma, and how can we actually prevent people from experiencing the events that are leading to these problematic health, mental and physical health problems. Um, in addition to that, I think a really high level priority, um, in my opinion, is to work hard to include um, people of color in the research that we do on PTSD and its sequelae and really understand um, what the, what inequities look like. And, and they can span the range, whether it's just inequities in PTSD or inequities in the impacts of PTSD on health. I think we need to have a better understanding of that for um, you know, the, our broad population in a representative manner, um, because there are going to be different things that sort of are most important in driving PTSD among different people with different cultural backgrounds and experiences. Yeah, I think these are such important points in terms of really, you know, kind of the areas that we need to be targeting going forward. And maybe just to add, you know, to this in terms of the emphasis again, you know, on prevention of trauma, but then too, in terms of thinking kind of of the sequela that can onset increasing access to mental health care. And so we know see that you know, over 50% of individuals with PTSD are not able to access mental health care for their condition, for their symptoms. And so how can we, you know, be increasing access to the types of treatments that really can help to be able to, you know, hopefully offset to some of these different psychological as well as physical health consequences down the line too. Yeah, I'll just jump in that. Um, you know, for, for TBI, thinking of at-risk populations, there's, um, there's of course, military veteran members, there's um, athletes, you know, sports-related injuries, there's um, more awareness now of TBIs occurring from intimate partner violence, um, and, you know, general car accidents and falls and all the ways that other people injure their, you know, have a head injury. Um, so I think that, you um, you know, certain settings are really important to increase 
targeted screening, such as substance use treatment settings, that would be very important, um, prisons and jails, um, um, domestic violence um, organizations, um, is really important to have more direct awareness on this um, topic and risk for secondary conditions, but also just more integrated treatment and integration between mental health and rehabilitation and um, primary care and substance use. Thank you all. Um, there, the questions are coming in now and I'm going to try to uh, pick and choose a little bit in, in the order that we uh, address them, but for the panelists, some are very specific questions about your presentation. And so I think answering them live might be a helpful adjunct to the, the conversation because we all multitask these days. So um, I wanted to start out with actually the first question because it asked about uh, children and youth and we didn't address that, those populations specifically. That question is, how can we better support children and youth of color? I'm very concerned about the impact of COVID racism and the impact of mental health on families of color. So I think there's something for many of you to answer in that uh, question. And I'd love to hear it. I think part of it is recognizing the combined impact of the um, COVID pandemic and the sort of racial pan racism pandemic and the mental health pandemic on um, on youth and understanding that you know as adults we have a we we tend to have more ability to cope with these sort of like huge changes. It's still hard for us as adults, but we can imagine that for children, they, you know, are struggling even more because they don't necessarily have those coping mechanisms and those skills to be able to manage their emotional reactions to what's going on, as well as the uncertainty um, in our society. And so I think part of it is really being able to recognize and, you know, allowing um, uh, and and showing that we understand as a society and as adults, as parents, as teachers, that there are so many things coming at these youth that, um, you know, it's understandable that they're having an extremely hard time coping. And so I think being able to integrate within schools or integrate within um, teaching parents how to help their children figure out the coping mechanisms that are going to help for them, um, because this is really a situation that we have no control over. Um, I think that's going to be one thing that's going to be really important. Um, and, and again, understanding that intersection between all these different experiences that are particularly affecting youth of color. Yeah, I would add to that just, you know, more attention to um, neighborhoods where these intersections occur um, and the cumulative experience in, in some of these neighborhoods um, in terms of prevention. So good, good opportunities here. I want to follow on with a question that's further down in the list, but I think it uh, it lends itself to uh, right now, and that is what is the role of empowerment, both on an individual and a broader societal level, in preventing trauma. I'm not sure that empowerment can prevent trauma, um, but empowerment can be an extremely um, healing way to address and cope with trauma. Um, in some of the, uh, one thing I did was run a study looking at um, racial stress and trauma groups for veterans of color at the VA and empowerment was a huge part of that intervention. Um, because, and empowerment is important because people need to feel like they have the ability to address their reactions to to things like racism or trauma in a way that feels empowering to them and makes them feel like you know, they are responding in the way that feels empowering. And so I think empowerment is crucial because we can really focus a lot on like the negatives of all the ways that trauma has negatively affected our lives, but to focus on, okay, so then now what do we do and how do we empower ourselves to keep going is a positive approach that I think is extremely appealing, particularly to people of color. Um, is what I've found. Um, so I, I think it's important. I don't know if it can prevent trauma from happening, but it can help people better cope with trauma so that it has less of an impact on their daily life. But if you look at empowerment from a community standpoint, so if you empower communities, 
I think that has good potential for prevention um, and for establishing new norms for communities. So we will not tolerate, you know, these behaviors or, you know, um, these events that are increase the likelihood of trauma. So I, I think there's good potential for community empowerment. Could I um, pivot a little bit looking at the, the questions that I do want to get to uh, more of them, but it seems we're, uh, we probably are not going to get to uh, all of them. And to think about uh, issues of culture and SES, I, the conversation wasn't specifically today about first world countries and high wealth countries, but generally the research that is being presented was conducted there. And I wondered if I could uh, ask about the intersection between what you were talking about and issues of culture and wealth as, as they play out across the, the globe. And I hope I didn't stump the panel. Well, uh, just a few quick thoughts off of the top of my head. Once again, I believe that in countries that um, are more impoverished, where events occur, I mean, take Haiti and hurricanes, take some of the African countries in genocide, uh, in countries that are probably least well equipped to deal with these things, those events are gonna have worse consequences. Um, also, I think in internationally, we need to think about um, refugees and people leaving one country and going to a next and their um, experiences of trauma as refugees or en route um, or in their new home. So all of those things are, are I believe, important um, and worth considering. Um, this might be a question for uh, Dr. Sumner, but uh, anyone can take it, which is, how would normalizing discussion of trauma help medical professionals to acknowledge their PTSD and therefore help people to treat this phenomena better in themselves and others? So I think the, the question is that some providers who are treating patients who have PTSD have PTSD. And so yeah. how would normalizing discussions of trauma help professionals uh, with that? I think that's a great question. Just kind of, you know, again, increasing the awareness about just how common these experiences are and the various impacts that can occur, I think can really be maybe kind of going against that idea of potential disempowerment of appreciating that, you know, one is not alone in experiencing these types of things and kind of having a greater awareness, I think can, you know, potentially then offer the opportunity for greater opportunities for, for help and just understanding of how these symptoms can play out. And I think, especially when thinking about from a healthcare provider, appreciating that certain experiences from that profession can potentially, you know, be traumatic and, you know, understanding the impacts that that can have on, you know, mental health as well. And so I think kind of, you know, reaching to with other providers, perhaps for, you know, an increased sense of social support too, and being able to kind of come together as a community to address these problems so that they can in turn also, you know, provide better care for patients, I think can be very valuable. So really appreciating kind of that broad reach that can happen for providers, but then also to be able to kind of appreciate that operating potentially in their patients as well. Well, I would just say also relevant to, very relevant to today is <clears throat> kind of the cumulative stress of COVID and the, what health providers have experienced and the traumas, whether major or micro or cumulative that they have seen in their patients and people dying. Um, I think it's just particularly relevant now to think about what providers have gone through and how they can build some resilience or help to heal themselves. That's a great point, Kathy. Uh, some of the, the comments uh, in the, or the questions do involve COVID and I hope we can get to those, but there's a, a, a couple that came in together that are about prevention. I'll read them uh, as one and then uh, ask people to uh, answer whatever aspects they feel are appropriate. Uh, what are some successful prevention strategies related to sexual violence, war related trauma, child abuse? And the other question is, a new kind of parenting education that reaches everyone everywhere could be a powerful form of trauma prevention. Agree, disagree? Okay. 
So, um, I, Rachel, if I could put you on the spot for a moment, because uh, TBI is something that people who study veterans pay a lot of attention to, but I think it's under-recognized, as you said, about 40% of the general population have had a, a, a TBI. And I, I know it's a particular issue for people who've experienced interpersonal violence uh, because of um, the, the physical assaults, but also people who have been physically assaulted, been in an auto accident. It really is a, a prevalent condition that can have long lasting impacts. And so I'm wondering about uh, where uh, prevention in the area of TBI, what, what you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think prevention in that regarding TBI has to be so multi faceted. It has to come in so many different ways. And I think, you know, for instance, um, sports related culture, there's, there's a, so much more awareness now and policies in place for youth um, to try to reduce head injuries and concussions for our youth athletes. Um, in more, you know, adult sports, they're trying very hard to create, um, and in the military for um, people who are deploying, they're trying to create equipment and, and um, you know, helmets and things that protect people's heads better. Um, I think that, you know, those are very important high-risk populations, but there are large portions of other populations at risk as well. Um, thinking of um, women and mostly women and some men, you know, experiencing intimate partner violence, I think that those situations, um, I've been quite interested in how substance use during those events plays a role and just increases risk for um, additional violence and risk for, um, um, you know, head injury, um, and just, you know, so policies, so, so those situations are, you know, clearly we need to do more work to make safer communities and environments where violence, like sexual violence, intimate partner violence is not occurring as much, and that'll help. Um, I think that, um, you know, motor vehicle policies, things like that. They, we have to come at this from so many different angles. And, I, and then I think that really it's the secondary tertiary prevention is so important to focus on the secondary conditions afterwards um, that we can, we can do a lot to try to prevent future morbidity and mortality. Thank you. Um, how can we educate uh, and train providers so they feel comfortable and equipped to talk with their patients about trauma? Studies suggest many barriers on the provider side to having this discussion, such as training, time, ability to triage a positive screen for trauma. Uh, how can we signal to patients that this is an important part of their medical history and something that can improve the quality of their care? Great question. I think there's a couple of things there. Um, one, we do know that providers can be effectively and adequately trained to talk about trauma um, in various different ways, whether that means doing actual trauma therapy or just you know being able to talk about trauma in a way that sort of um, doesn't sort of uh, negatively affect the patient. Um, and so we're able to train people to do that. And so I think it's a matter of you know, making that a standard type of training that providers go through. Um, the other thing I think is that, um, you know, people have different understanding, understandings and conceptualizations of trauma and what it is and how it affects them based on their cultural background. And so I think in addition to training providers to be able to talk about trauma um, in an effective way, whether that's a short conversation or, or you know, actual treatment, um, I think there needs to be, in addition to that training and understanding about how people may think about trauma or how to ask someone how they think about trauma so that it can be discussed with a patient in a way that feels relevant to them and doesn't make them feel like they're being diagnosed with anything necessarily, but um, in a way where they can understand, okay, these experiences that you had, whatever you might call them, are affecting your health today and they're important to address. <coughs> but people are not going to think about trauma in the same way. So we also have to think about how we talk about it based on who we're talking to. Well, I would add to that. Um, and I think the panel is probably too young to remember, <laughs> to remember some of these things, but um, Eli Lilly actually changed the way we think about depression because Eli Lilly introduced Prozac 
which was a pill that primary care providers could, could prescribe. Um, they did a huge community education program. So patients understood, hey, I can take this pill and it's, you know, it's going to be okay. And they educated patients about symptoms. So if we can pro give providers um, primary, and I'm thinking more primary care because that's kind of where the screening takes place, screening and referral, we'll let providers know that we have effective treatments, um, kind of educate patients too about some of the symptoms so that they're more receptive to um, receiving a referral. I think that would really move us forward in a huge way. Anyone else want to weigh in? Okay, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, go to the next uh, question. Uh, since doctors Mamie P and Kenneth Clark, the field of psychology has led others in discourse on the effects of racism. Although lately it seems much of this work has gone ignored as not enough change in the field has occurred given the volume of research that's been published. What do you think of the, the field of psychology needs to do differently this time now that popular discourse has returned to racism and its most potent effect trauma? Um, I think that's a, it, it's a complex question um, and I appreciate it being asked. Um, I think there's so many different things we need to do in psychology to, to do this. So, you know, I'll just name a few, you know, I think we need to um, first have a lot more work and research focusing on how, when somebody does experience racism and it leads to things like trauma, how can we actually address that and reduce the impact of racism and discrimination and racial stress on the mental health of marginalized communities, not just people of color, but, um, you know, any community, any, any person who experiences discrimination based on their identity. Um, I think a really big thing that is more sort of like overarching for the field is to really better integrate a consideration of environmental, cultural, historical factors that contribute to mental health problems among marginalized populations. Um, we have a big focus in <clears throat> clinical psychology, especially on you know, biological markers and the brain and how that all contributes to mental health. But I think that that unfortunately that's been to a certain extent at the exclusion of really focusing on these broader societal, structural, environmental factors that contribute to mental health problems. Um, and so I think that that's going to be crucial. And then just sort of like, you know, increasing the representation of marginalized individuals, you know, people from marginalized communities in research. Um, creating research that's relevant to those communities, um, being involved in community, being connected to community in order to, um, you know, foster trust and, um, and, and the desire to participate in, in studies and things like that, improving funding priorities, you know, so that priorities aren't just focused on things like you know, neuroscience and things like that, but really that funding prioritizes focusing on community-based interventions. Um, and, you know, I think in addition, publishing priorities. Uh, recently, I, I've been working on a paper where we looked at um, papers that have been published in top clinical science journals over the years and very small percentage of those papers were focused on issues um, related to people with minority identities or with um, underrepresented identities. Um, and finally, I'll say that I think we really need to look at representation and research and science among scientists, among research participants and all of that at all levels as um, like essential for promoting science and moving it forward rather than like a political issue. Um, you know, it, it's really not political. It's really about how can we keep our science relevant and how can we actually make sure our science is making a difference for people who are, who are in the most need of help. Thank you very much, Juliet. I want to uh, uh, go to a question that uh, has been receiving uh, media attention recently, and it has to do with climate change. In the midst of the pandemic, we are dealing with climate change and a growing number of traumatic climate experiences for both adults and children. Can anyone speak to the PTSD or complex PTSD this causes? I think I would open it out to just having your thoughts on the, the role of climate change events in the public health conversation that we're having today.
I'll just note that these types of events that are coming about as a result of changing climate in terms of, you know, wildfires, hurricanes, these sort of natural disaster events that are becoming, you know, it seems more and more common really can be triggers for, you know, a whole host of different psychological responses, including PTSD. And I think really appreciating the impact that these can have. These are, you know, events that are notable in terms of the the mental health impact. And so we shouldn't just kind of brush them off to the side, but really kind of take stock of just how, how much they can have an impact on us and, you know, really be kind of, again, marginal, marginal marshalling um, different resources for, you know, mental health care and connecting people with resources as, you know, these events, again, are becoming such, such a kind of commonality in our day to day. Well, but once again, I think it's the areas, the countries that are least able to cope that are the ones that are the hardest hit. And, you know, you take an earthquake, in Chile, they did, we hardly heard anything at all about that earthquake or even an earthquake in the United States, but an earthquake in, um, you know, rural Eastern Turkey that, you know, almost destroyed a whole village or earthquakes, um, other parts of the world where, you know, they don't have building codes um, are going to have more of a, an, an impact. So I think, well, we need to think about those, you know, disasters, earthquakes and fires and tsunamis. Um, but then there's also that kind of insidious, that slow, so slow changes. I live on an island. Um, so I may actually have beachfront property, you know, in, in before too long, but I'm acutely aware that the tides are rising and, you know, maybe cumulatively over time, that's going to be cause, uh, cause issues and traumas? I, I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting question. And whether young people are more attuned to that. I think my granddaughters who are, you know, 10 and 13 are very much more attuned to that and very much more concerned and potentially maybe more traumatized by things like that. I see a couple of questions here um, that are related to TBI. So uh, Dr. Adams, um, does the person's age at time of TBI factor into any of the perfect storm? And then are there any studies looking at these risks of TBI suicide opioids with older adults or older veterans? Um, yeah, I mean, I think age, age, uh, age affects um, likelihood of exposure to TBI. Um, age also affects likelihood of receipt of prescription opioids. So um, I think older adults, also some of those neurobehavioral consequences we talked about with medication mismanagement, having multiple medications, um, there could be greater risk factors for sort of progressing from, you know, starting prescription opioid to moving on to um, long-term use with older adults. Um, I would say that exact question among this topic hasn't really been looked at closely. With regards to um, overlap of you know, risk for death by suicide or overdose um, and TBI, I think the field in general, um, you know, there's, there's so much great work um, on, on trying to um, you know, address the opioid epidemic in our country and, and other drug overdose um, epidemic. And then there's so much great work on the suicide crisis as well. And I think there's not um, that much sort of thinking about how those crises may be overlapping and more work is needed in that area. Um, there's the, the, some researchers are thinking about deaths of despair now and overlapping risk for suicide overdose and alcohol related causes and how despair may be related to that. Um, in that work, I don't think TBI has been considered yet. So I think there's a lot more work to do um, to drill into this um, risk. Thank you. Uh, and one more question I see on TBI while you're <laughs> on camera. Um, can the TBI affected brain benefit from regulation interventions or does TBI interfere with such interventions being effective? And I'm, I'm assuming that might mean perhaps mindfulness unless I'm misunderstanding the, the question, but strategies uh, to help with regulation. Yeah, that's an important, um, I think that there so much more 
work needs to be done on how persons with TBI may be responding to certain types of treatment um, because of potential cognitive um, challenges or remembering or symptoms of the TBI can be misperceived as, um, you know, someone not being compliant with therapy or with substance use treatment and the provider might misunderstand this person if they don't understand their history of TBI. So I think that's where we're encouraging treatment providers to understand more about history. My, with mindfulness specifically, I, I would think it would be beneficial. I don't, I don't know why it, it wouldn't be, but perhaps it would require a little bit more, um, you know, accommodations to teach those methods and but more work is certainly needed. Thank you. Here's a question that I think uh, can anyone can uh, answer from the perspective of their uh, particular focus. And the question is, does the trauma related event influence the likelihood of PTSD and or the trajectory? Uh, for example, do you see differences in outcomes related to long-term trauma and or multi-event trauma, such as adverse childhood experiences and war versus natural disasters versus a traffic accident and so on? I think when people experience chronic um, exposure to exposure to trauma, especially at a young age, oftentimes, um, sometimes people really don't realize that what they're experiencing or what they've experienced is trauma. So, and, and, and those experiences because they're chronic and because they start so early in life, it almost, be, a lot of the um, consequences of that trauma end up being sort of ingrained in that individual. And it feels like it's who they are. And in a lot of ways it is, but I think that there needs to be, um, sort of an understanding that like chronic trauma, chronic exposure to trauma and, and things like racism and things like that probably need a different approach than, or may need a different approach in some ways than our like typical EBTs. It really depends on what sort of the outcome is that we're looking at or what, what we're really looking at. But like, you know, especially for racism related trauma, we need a, a different approach um, for that like sort of chronic, emotional, psychological injury type of trauma, racial trauma. Um, and <clears throat> that may be the case for things like, you know, chronic, um, uh, trauma or complex PTSD or, you know, different ways that we talk about that, there may be a different approach needed um, other than, you know, trauma-focused therapy. So I think we need to consider that and better understand, you know, what treatment looks like when somebody has experienced these chronic traumas throughout the course of their life um, and be able to offer, um, you know, from a more sort of like policy level, be able to give people uh, coverage for getting the care that they need, no matter how long they need that care, because some people need care for quite a long period of time because they've been, they've gone 30 years in their life experiencing trauma after trauma. And now we need another, you know, we're not going to fix that in, you know, 12 sessions. And so I think that that's another sort of policy level issue that we need to focus on is how do we make sure that people have access to what they actually need in order to get better based on what they've experienced. I'd like to go back to the um, one point that you in that question, uh, Paula, you raised, which was, does type of trauma make a difference? Um, and I'd like to go back to the case of men versus women. Um, I think one of the panelists rightly pointed out that um, women have a much higher prevalence of PTSD. I think it's about two to one in you know, most of the surveys um, that have been done. And yet, um, men have higher rates of trauma exposure. So it's that conundrum. Um, however, it's the interpersonal traumas that women have, you know, the rape, um, the domestic violence, the, you know, one-on-one -on -one kinds of situations um, that seem to confer, confer a higher rate of PTSD. Um, in addition to there may be other responses that women might have, um, but I think that's a, an interesting point to raise here. Uh, Kathy, thank you. That was a great way to uh, end the discussion. And I say that because Dr. Galea we're on time now and I see Dr. Galea is on the screen and he's going to wrap up uh, the morning session. Thank you all so much. And I wanna thank the audience too for the many provocative uh, ideas. The discussion has been really stimulating and uh, I hope uh, people uh, continue to the conversation in this afternoon session as well. So thank you.
Dr. Well, Gulliher. Well, thank you, Dr. Schnorr. And, uh, and uh, I'd like to echo Dr. Schnorr and thanking Dr. Seiko, Adams, McLendon, McGruder, and Sumner. What, what a terrific uh, conversation. I, I um, learned uh, tremendously from the conversation. I actually also learned a lot from the audience questions. I thought um, there were some terrific questions asked from the audience. I thought some of the questions that were opened up about the definition of trauma and how we how we grapple with that in, in, a, in a context when we're now understanding the manufacture of trauma across multiple levels and how one incorporates systemic systemic traumas that um, ultimately shape our individual experiences into our diagnostic thinking. I think these are really interesting, important questions. And I would look forward to the scholarship in the coming years and decades that will sort it out. So I want to say thank you to the panelists for really um, illuminating those issues. And thank you to the audience for um, highlighting them. And th thank you, Dr. Schnorr, for excellent moderation. For everybody who joined us today, thank you for joining us this morning or this afternoon. We'll resume the second half of uh, today's uh, event at 1.15 Eastern. And for anybody who's in the audience, you can actually use the same link that you use for this morning at 1.15 Eastern to get back on. Everybody, thank you. Have a good afternoon. Have a good evening. Take good care.